this is great fun here. You know, I mean, the, the colors, are, colors are out there, and we could all be outside enjoying the sunshine. But of course, we're not. In fact, if you visited the real America recently, you'll notice that uh, there are other things happening in the land. One of which is that under our great uh, abundance, do we have a pointer here? Oh, yes. Under our great abundance, we have, uh, in fact, created a rather interesting variant of the species. Now, as um, Malcolm was just saying, this has got nothing to do with genetics. It's all happened in the last 25 years. And it's a cultural shift which has created for us a whole new way of thinking about the human body. So what I'm going to tell you about is some of my thoughts as a neuroscientist. I grew up in England, came here about 30 years ago now, and I've been fascinated by America because it is indeed the great experiment of the Enlightenment. Now this is where we thought the rational concepts of Europe were going to be put in place and it was going to work like a charm. In fact, it has worked, but it hasn't worked quite the way we thought it did. So, as we come now to a reflection, which we must do, rather than thinking we have the perfect society on the planet, there are certain things we have to keep in mind. And what I'm going to do is take you through a little bit about the brain, a little bit about how markets work, if you think about them from the standpoint of a neuroscientist, and then something about the addictive cycle, which is the Dorito cycle that we heard about earlier. So the brain is actually three brains. There's the lizard brain, the gecko brain, the one that eats its young and, in fact, is extraordinarily competitive and territorial. And then there's the other, on top of it, which came about at the beginning of the dinosaur era, which is the furry mammals. We have a lot of that in us. They actually are attached to their children, but they don't think a great deal about the future. And then you've got the human brain, which is only about 200,000 years old, believe it or not. We're a very recent species. And it's just this little tiny part above your eyes which makes us human. This is the frontal lobe, the executive lobe, the sort of thing that allows you to turn poverty into opportunity, as Malcolm was talking about it. Well, when we are in danger, it's this system that works for us. When you put your hand on a hot stove, you don't think about it, you take it away immediately. What I'm going to suggest to you is that abundance does the same thing. It's only during scarcity that we actually use the human intelligence to the effect that we can use it. And think about that. We managed to come out of a period of great turmoil in the planetary climate. A couple of hundred thousand years ago, we started to migrate out of Africa about 80,000 years ago. We're now all over the planet. And we're doing all sorts of crazy things to the planet, as we're hearing again and again in this conference. But the fact is that that particular behavior came out of scarcity. It was during that period of time when we were constrained and we had to be innovative that we began to do the creative things of which pop tech is a perfect example in terms of its evolution. So, in fact, that reptilian area is what the, account, what the accountants and the economists would call a short-term discounting. We are much more fixed on the future, immediate future, than we are on the long-term future. It's very difficult to get us away from thinking about the present. In fact, if you don't believe that, tonight at dinner, when you're faced with your chocolate cake, your cortex will tell you, well, I've had so much good food at Pop Tech, I probably shouldn't eat it all, but most of us will. In fact, that's a very interesting point made by Malcolm too, which is that the, if you put a marshmallow in front of a child, you know this, you know this uh, study probably, and then you say, I'm leaving the room for a little while, I'll be back. But if you don't eat the marshmallow, before I come back, we'll give you two. About 40% of kids can manage to survive the challenge of having that marshmallow in front of them. They're the ones who, 10 years later, do extremely well in terms of academic and social 
prowess. It's that constraint, it's the use of the frontal lobe which enables us to keep ourselves from this profligate uh, experience that we've been having here in the US in the last 25 years. How does this work? We have to go to markets. Markets are a natural evolution of human social behavior. There's nothing particularly curious about them. We didn't invent them, they just happened. Adam Smith, of course, who was a professor of moral philosophy and basically a psychologist, wrote an important book, the, the Moral Sentiments book, and then later wrote the book which is famous, The Wealth of Nations, published in an important year, 1776. In that book, he basically said that you can create a human economy by allowing individuals to do what they want to do. That self-interest will drive the interest of the whole society. So if you reduce it to this cartoon, on one side, what he called self-love, what we call self-interest, drives the market. There are three engines to the market. Self-interest, curiosity, very, very important. Why do you think we have all this technology around us? Because we're fascinated. It's going to be very difficult to make a Nokia last for 25 years. I have one that's nine years old, but everybody wants a new gizmo. It wants to be able to take pictures of yourself while you're actually listening to somebody talk to you. I mean, the whole thing, it needs to be pink, it needs to be green. I mean, the fact is that we are hooked on curiosity. Smith knew that in those days when the watch was coming in. He pointed out that a person who spends five guineas on a watch or 50 guineas on a watch, neither of them are necessarily on time. It's got nothing to do with the watch. <laughs> and of course, the other thing is the social ambition. Now, if you just look at some of this, you find that the human brain, these three parts of the brain are actually yoked together by a series of superhighways. The most important one, because we're not flush for time today to think about is the reward pathway. Now the reward pathway comes up from the base of the brain and goes around and arborizes through that frontal cortex. But it also connects with the issue of the amygdala, which is the fear center. This is the one that in danger saves us. That's the one that takes your hand away from the hot stove. These systems are very easily hijacked and they're also very easily addicted and those are the systems that the market tunes in with. So these guys may look a little different from what we are, but they're not. They are using the same brain as we use when we work in the market. Self-interest, curiosity, risk-taking, competing for resources, as you heard. We're competing for those fish in the sea. We're killing them all off, and this is very important. Social ambition. We always want a little more than we have. It's the old business of being at the trough first. Now, think about that. You know, the old joke is that what's a happy man? The man who earns a little more than his brother-in-law, yeah? But it goes throughout our society, and America has made a cultural icon of that. So we are, in fact, constantly upgrading. Our current housing market is a perfect example of how more is never enough. Let's look at the other side of this equation, because don't forget, this is supposed to be a balance. This is a system which he, uh, Smith, called the invisible hand. It's not magic, it's not invisible, it's really two hands. It's the engine, and at the other side, it's the constraint. The constraint, in Smith's mind, was social sympathy. Now, you might think that's sort of silly. How could that be constraining? Well, he argued in this enlightenment uh, beginning that, in fact, it was the way in which all of us wanted to be together. We wanted to be liked by other people, and it was that liking by other people that constrained us. We didn't want to do anything that annoyed somebody. You don't want to sell bad meat because nobody will come back to you. And in fact, that whole element to him was the brake on the engine. He argued it so successfully that, in fact, people still believe it, that there are free markets. But let me tell you how it's changed. First of all, how does it work? See this picture here? This young baby, eight months old, is looking at me. I'm taking a photograph. She likes the flash. Her mother is looking at her. The 
uh, brother is looking at his sister, the aunt is looking at the brother, etc., etc. Everybody is looking at everybody else for obviously good reasons. All of you can immediately tell who won the competition. Miss Teenage America 1972. This woman is about, oh, wonderful. This young lady is about to dissolve into tears. That is a fundamental ability that we all have in the same way as we can distinguish red from white from blue. It's fundamentally wired into the brain, but it is culturally dependent. If you put somebody's head in a scanner and ask them to, to imagine this or to imitate this picture, then when you imitate it, your motor cortex begins to light up. When you imagine it, just observe it, it disappears. The, the, it, the, the activity drops. However, there is a part of the brain in front of this, the premotor cortex, which when you ask that experiment to be run again, during imitation, it continues to fire, but then during observation, it also fires. We are actually imagining that in our own minds. So as you've probably seen these ski issues, where you can go down a hill watching a videotape and you keep doing it in your mind and actually you turn out to be a better skier. We are chameleons. We actually manage to learn from each other. Look at this. You remember this fellow? He used to walk around in sweaters. He was a president, I think. Well, look what happens. This is his chief of staff. As the president moves, so does the chief of staff move. He creates the body which is identical to the posture of his dominant friend. The way this works then is that the cortex educates this fear center. It educates the amygdala and over a long period of time it changes the way in which you behave. That is why Chinese students who are acculturated in not giving up don't give up. It's learned behavior. It's much more fragile than the genetic side of things. So Smith, of course, was writing in the 18th century. This house was built a year after his actual book was published, The Wealth of Nations. They were closely knit communities, and they were constrained, not only by the community itself, but by the way in which the climate and the territory confined people. People didn't leave their villages. They had to be together. That was the natural constraint on the market at that time. He couldn't foresee that the technology we live in now, the way in which the American business model, that wonderful thing which I'll show you in just a second, and the material affluence that we have experienced in this country, that completely changes the contingencies and changes the way in which we behave. Look at these people. They are not talking to each other. They're working with their technology. The cell phone, the... Uh, looks like a, it's probably a, um, a, a cell phone, perhaps, or something else, and a, 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 a laptop. So when you get to this point where you are reducing the amount of interaction, and at the same time, you increase the speed at which we can move around the world, you increase the speed at which we can move information around the world, you've suddenly changed the cultural contingencies. And on top of that, we have this mythology. We have a mythology that the free market must be free. Self-interest rules, no tax redistribution, stay out of the way of the market. Of course, the market is not free. We know that now. In fact, the amount of information that we have in our lives and the amount of commercial opportunity is such that we are addicting ourselves. Houses are much bigger, families are much smaller. They have 120, 1,260 varieties of shampoo on the... Now, that's every morning I thank God that my hair fell out, because how do you guys make the decision? And of course we've invented other things. The credit card. Now you can get a credit card in which you have to pay nothing for a year, but once you start Paying, you pay, if you default, 40%. This is an addictive culture that we have built for ourselves. And so, of course, 
Now, 70% of Americans do not pay off their credit cards every month, and they are paying usury interest. It's an addiction. What you find in addiction is that the frontal lobes go to sleep. This is a normal person playing a card, card game. You can see that their frontal lobes actually work. In the addict, nothing works. They actually go to sleep, and they do worse after their second trial than their first trial. We spend more money in America per capita than all other industrialized countries. How do we do that? Because we're not more productive. We're 24,000 against about 17. We're not more productive. We just work harder. We spend much more time supporting our stuff. And we save nothing. This is what everybody does who becomes addicted. This is the mythology, is it not, that we have to be a care of the, take care of the addict because otherwise they'll take care of us by stealing things. We've invented this positive feedback loop which just doesn't work. Anybody who's a physiologist knows that positive feedback loops do not work. They, in fact, they destroy themselves. So this self-interest, competition, and curiosity, which is the market driver, we have invented this fast new world, this uh, consumer opportunity, the manic response, which then through debt financing, we know a lot about that at the moment, and the technical innovation of whether it be uh, how to package financial instruments, how to package anything, this just generates this rapid cycle which eventually implodes and the victims are ourselves, especially in terms of sleep. So Smith's contingency then drops way back into this particular position where self-love is completely outranking social sentiment. And what you should also know is that America has become a less socially mobile society than has Europe. The correlation between a father's or parent's income in this country and a child is about 0.56. In Europe, it's about 0.23. And there are obvious reasons for that, but it, it, the, the fact that we believe we're the country of opportunity, it no longer is true. We are the world's greatest debtor, we have put ourselves into an extraordinary position. And as George Carlin says, it is called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe in it. That is something which I think we are now worrying a lot about. But the good news is this. This is the good news because now we will stop and think and we'll get back to a period of scarcity perhaps when we will understand what it is that has happened to us. And we will begin to use that creativity that you see in this wonderful conference to find our way out of this backwater. You see, we've learned that science and technology enable us to indulge our desires, but they do nothing to change them. And also, Commonwealth matters. Why do they call it the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Virginia? It's because in those days, in the 18th century, we recognized that a common platform was necessary for the individual to be an individual. I have a few minutes left, maybe two or three. I'm going to ask you a few questions. How many of you live more than 1,000 miles from where you were born? Put your hands up. Look around. Over, it's probably 60% of the audience, maybe more. We are migrants in this country. That makes a big difference. And we are migrants internally. It breaks up the social networks. And it also has a genetic function, which I don't have time to tell you about. How many of you, when you are eating in a restaurant, keep your cell phone on? Most of you, again, huh? So when you, when you get that telephone call, you hang up on the person you're talking to, yes? It is, so the technology has begun to change the way in which we live. How many of you, just to pick one at random, drink more than four cups of coffee a day? Not so much there. That's good. That's good. OK. And how many of you sleep less than seven hours a night? Uh, too many of you. See, this is what happens. This is all connected together. This whole thing is connected together. We can't just think about caffeine and fast food and reduced exercise. It's more complicated than that. Upstream is the sleep debt. Americans, on the average, deprive themselves of two hours of sleep every night. Sometimes they catch up at the weekends. 
So we are a nation not only in monetary debt, but in sleep debt. And this, of course, comes from a 60 to 80 hour work week. I won't ask how many hours people were putting in before they organized this conference, yes? Competition, time urgency, the fast new world. Do you know that in one of those big Starbucks coffees, there is something like 800 milligrams of caffeine, which is about eight times the average cup? You could really drive yourself crazy drinking that stuff. And the obesity is not the only thing. We've got anxiety and depression going through the roof, etc. Now, the interesting thing here, and I'm within just a few slides of finishing. <laughs> it's gone to 25 minutes. Do I have another 25 minutes? The, the, um, the fact is that this is connected together in a very physiological way. The studies show that if you sleep less, you weigh more. And this is because, in fact, there are two interesting hormones, one of which is leptin, that suppresses appetite, which gets reduced during sleep deprivation, and ghrelin, which actually increases appetite. The neurosurgeon friend of mine at UCLA says he knows that because every time he comes home after a, after a night on call, in fact, he is ravenous for salt, fat, and all those good things that we didn't get on the tundra. We also, those of you who, who do sleep deprive yourself, you'll know that in fact at night, when you don't sleep well, the next morning you can't quite figure out whether you're getting a cold or not. And that's probably because of the inflammatory cytokines that rise when you're sleep deprived. So in fact, we must think about what goes on upstream. This is related, definitely, to this but it's also related to everything else that we've created. So, take care of yourself. Time is the most important thing. Make the technology work for you. Know your appetite, eat slowly and with others. Exercise, walk as much as you can. Good for the planet, good for you. And get some sleep. That's the most important thing of all. <laughs>